blend of folks. Thank you, Craig. I know that we have kind of a blend of folks joining us today. Some folks are joining from their computers. There's a group of people at the United Way there in Lubbock joining uh, from the same room. Um, so we're, however you got here, we're really happy that you're here and happy to share this information with you. Um, there is a poll question up on the screen right now, and, and I thought maybe for the folks that are joining in a shared space, if you could just, um, you know, you can uh, have people type into the chat um, on a scale of one to five, how familiar are you with this COC program? Uh, and we're asking you to pick one, you know, one, two, three, four, five, kind of the standard Likert scale, one being not at all and five being expert. Um, and uh, that will just kind of help us better understand who is in this space today. You don't have to do it like right this second, uh, but that's something to think about. And while you're thinking about that or place it, um, getting that into the chat, um, we will uh, just get started. So. Um, my name is Jim Ward. I am the Director of Planning for the Texas Homeless Network. Uh, and I just realized that I don't have my video on. So there I am. I am a real person. I do exist. Uh, I live in uh, Hayes County, which is south of Austin, in between Austin and, uh, and San Antonio. Um, and I would have uh, Hope introduce herself um, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just kind of keep going from there. Hi there, I'm Hope Rogers. I'm the COC Performance Manager for the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care. Uh, so I lead the local application process for the Continuum of Care program and support COC funded projects throughout the Balance of State. Um, and I live in uh, the Denton County area, so just north of Dallas. And if you don't know what we're talking about with the continuum of care, that is totally okay. We're going to dig into that a little bit. Um, the other person that's on this slide, Axton Nichols, who is our COC performance coordinator, may join us a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, and if not, we'll hope and I, I think we'll we'll be able to make it. But just so you know, he may join uh, from the THN team as well. And while we didn't have uh, Craig on a slide, you may know Craig, Craig uh, Blaze Fierro is our COC program coordinator. He makes everything happen on the back end here and uh, we're really grateful for him. Um, so the agenda for today's meeting, um, you know, we were wanting folks to walk away from this with a few basic things, right? We want folks to have kind of a basic understanding of this COC program, um, what we're talking about when we say this COC program, what we're talking about when we say balance of state COC. Uh, we want folks to understand how to access the funding that is associated with the continuum of care, um, the application process itself, how to submit an application, um, talk a little bit about HUD's priorities and the COC's priorities, and then hopefully if we have time, save a, save a little bit there for questions and answers. So I will say that this is a uh, incredibly dense subject matter, so I would expect that there are questions. If you do have questions, please, um, you know, put them in the chat and we will address them uh, verbally. Um, if we're not able to address them verbally, we will follow up with you after this uh, meeting is over um, in writing. Um, similarly, we are recording this presentation and it will be sent out to the South Plains Homeless Consortium and, uh, and Valerie there at uh, Echo West Texas to share with, with stakeholders in the community. Um, and yeah, uh, I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Hope. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so we as THN serve as the lead agency and the collaborative applicant to the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, which means we are tasked with carrying out the statutory requirements of operating a continuum of care, which are defined in um, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, which include running the local competitive application process for the Continuum of Care program, which is largely what we're here to talk about today. Um, but the definition of Continuum of Care is layered, as you can see here on screen. Um, so HUD defines a COC as not only the group that organizes um, or is tasked with carrying out the responsibilities under the COC program in a given geographic region, 
uh, but it is also a community-based planning network for homelessness assistance, which includes, uh, you know, all the folks in this room and stakeholders throughout the balance of state. Um, it is also the geographic area covered by the community-based planning network, uh, which I'll show here on screen in just a second. Uh, and lastly, it is uh, a program operated by HUD. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, thank you. Um, so in addition to serving as the collaborative applicant to the COC program uh, for the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, uh, we also serve as the HMIS lead agency for the Balance of State. HMIS is an acronym that I'm sure many folks are familiar with, but if not, uh, it stands for the Homelessness Management Information System, which is a system that providers throughout the balance of state use to enter and manage client level data and client level outcomes. Um, and the balance of state spans 215 of Texas's 254 counties or about 84% of Texas's land mass. So this is a map of continuum of cares in Texas. We are one of 11 COCs in the state and we serve all the counties in orange. Um, our COC is a bit unique simply because of the sheer size of our region. Um, our size can sometimes put us at a bit of a disadvantage compared to smaller COCs. Uh, because COCs are tasked with creating uh, systems and processes and opportunities uh, for that can work for all of the providers in their region. Uh, and as you can imagine, that is uh, much easier to do when you're in a, a smaller single county COC or a group of COCs. Um, so we definitely have our work cut out for us uh, in this arena. So moving on to HUD's COC program, which is again uh, within the definition of a COC, um, the purpose of the COC program um, as HUD defines it is a method for advancing effective use of mainstream resources, uh, advancing community-wide commitment towards uh, making homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring, providing funding that allows eligible entities, not only in the balance of state, but nationally, the ability to uh, rehouse individuals and families experiencing homelessness, uh, while at the same time minimizing the trauma that they experience, um, in addition to optimizing self-sufficiency for the household served, uh, with the ultimate goal that folks served in these programs exit to permanent housing and are able to maintain permanent housing as a result of being served in these projects. Um, so moving on to some commonly funded housing interventions in the COC program, HUD refers to these as uh, project components, which if you plan to apply in our local application process, you'll see the term project component quite a bit. Um, but in general, the COC program funds housing components and supportive services paired with holistic case management um, through three primary interventions. Uh, the first is rapid rehousing, which um, is short to medium term uh, assistance, so up to 24 months, uh, paired with wraparound services and holistic case management. Uh, this is generally the project type that has the largest reach. Um, because it has the most, uh, the, the broadest eligibility criteria. So anyone served on this, under this project type has to satisfy or meet the requirements of literal homelessness. Uh, so living in emergency shelter, a place not meant for human habitation, uh, anyone under category one um, or also category four fleeing domestic violence can be served in this project type. Uh, permanent supportive housing is really similar to rapid rehousing with a few distinct differences. Uh, one difference being uh, the, the amount of time that someone can benefit from a permanent supportive housing project. Uh, so PSH is not time limited, uh, whereas rapid rehousing is limited to 24 months of assistance. Um, and that is because PSH is intended to serve folks who are experiencing chronic homelessness 
which HUD defines as uh, having experienced 12 months of homelessness and having an accompanying disability. Uh, so these are generally the folks who are the most vulnerable in a given community and who really need um, non-time limited uh, housing subsidy in order to prevent a return to homelessness. Um, often these folks uh, will transition out of a PSH project into another housing subsidy like a housing choice voucher. Um, the third commonly funded component is a relatively new component. It's been around for a couple of years, uh, and that is the joint component transitional housing and rapid rehousing project type, uh, sometimes referred to as the joint component project type. Um, and this combines transitional housing and rapid rehousing into a single project type where participants can benefit from both components up to 24 months of assistance. Um, so participant choice is really uh, central to this intervention um, and participants and clients should have access to uh, both components throughout the lifetime of their enrollment in this project. Uh, and providers should be reevaluating routinely uh, and often whether or not the intervention the client is in best meets their needs and then moving them appropriately across the components based on the unique needs of each household. Um, so in this project type, you could not, um, for example, require that every participant comes into transitional housing and then stays in transitional housing for three to six months before they can graduate to rapid rehousing. Um, you have to offer both from the beginning and throughout the duration of the project. Uh, hey y'all, oh, um, I think uh, slide nine is mine and I, I think we may have um, inadvertently omitted a slide uh, in this presentation and so uh, I apologize for that um, and, and I can't put my finger on where it went. So, I mean, we're just gonna keep going with this. Um, but uh, you may be thinking like, well, what, like what will the COC program fund? And that can kind of be summarized in uh, about four buckets. So those four buckets are the housing assistance that someone will need to stabilize uh, from their experience of homelessness. So that's typically what HUD calls tenant-based rental assistance, which is a rental subsidy that follows the participant throughout the lifetime of their participation in the program. Um, that is uh, all HUD assistance has to be considered reasonable for the area, means meaning that HUD has used some formula that I don't fully understand to calculate how much a one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom uh, housing in your community costs. And so costs requested under tenant-based rental assistance or any of the other um, housing components are limited to the extent to which they can be requested to fair market rent. Not something you really need to understand right now, but this is not uh, something that you get to set your own budget for. This is uh, really based on how many people you're planning to serve, what size unit you anticipate that they will need, and your community's fair market rent. So something to consider as you're, as you're thinking about the continuum of care program. An additional activity that is funded by the Continuum of Care Program for all housing interventions, so that's RAPID, PSH, and the Joint Component Projects, are supportive services. So any supportive service, for example, that's necessary to help someone obtain or retain their housing placement can be eligible. These include things like Hope was mentioning earlier, holistic case management um, that's focused on housing stability, right? Like if you're doing service coordination for people to keep them in their home, that's an eligible activity. Mental health services likewise are eligible activities. Outpatient substance abuse treatment is an eligible activity. Educational costs uh, for vocational, um, you know, for increasing someone's uh, access to income through work is an eligible cost. Vocational training, trade schools are eligible costs. There are a variety of things that HUD has built into the COC program that will help people stabilize and hopefully 
retain their housing once the assistance stops. Additionally, the cost of participating in the homeless management information system or a comparable database are, are eligible. So, you know, with these programs, HUD is, as you can probably imagine, pretty um, particular about their documentation. And so the cost of entering data into HMIS, pulling reports from the homeless management information system, uh, or participating in a comparable database are, are, um, are eligible. Additionally, administrative costs, up to 10% of the uh, line items above would be eligible. So thinking about that in another way, if you thought that your rental assistance and supportive services were gonna cost $100,000, you could request an additional $10,000 on top of that for the administrative cost of doing, of doing business. Uh, additionally, if you have a negotiated indirect cost rate with a federal agency, not HUD necessarily, but if your organization has a negotiated indirect, indirect cost rate, you can also apply your indirect cost rate to the COC uh, funding. Um, and I'm going to move us along here. I think something that's also really important to talk about is what HUD will not fund, um, because that's almost easier than talking about what they will fund. So HUD will not fund emergency shelter with COC program dollars. They have other federal programs that will fund emergency shelter. Uh, that includes things like capital costs, your acquisition, construction, rehabilitation, and soft costs, or operating um, staffing costs, utilities, that sort of thing. HUD is really interested in uh, permanent housing, so they will not typically fund things that they consider to be temporary housing. That looks like standalone transitional housing is not an eligible uh, component type under the COC program. And so that if you are planning to participate in the competition and you're attracted to that joint component rapid rehousing project, you really wanna keep in mind that you, you must have both components of that project type in order for HUD to consider that a viable project. Not necessarily that both components must be requested from HUD, but that you do have to have both uh, to be considered uh, an eligible project. And similarly, uh, while it's a great need in almost every community, in fact, I think I can just say every community, HUD will not fund what they call homelessness prevention. So families that are at risk, that are doubled up or otherwise do not meet the Hearth Act definition of homelessness. So these are folks that I know I saw community and schools on the registration list. If you know the CIS is here, that doesn't automatically include uh, youth, school-age youth that qualify under the McKinney-Vento definition. They may um, qualify uh, under the HEARTH definition, but that does not, again, count folks that are doubled up or otherwise do not meet HUD's definition of literal homelessness. Um, so in general, when we're talking about who can administer these funds, any 501c3 nonprofit, uh, state or local government, an instrumentality of a local government. So think things like the local mental health authority or a public housing agency are eligible to administer COC program funds. The key things are the applicant must have at the time of application, uh, they must be active in the system for award management or SAM.gov. So you must have an active SAM registration with no exclusions. You must have a unique entity identification number, formerly a DUNS number. That is part of registering with SAM. So you, if you're registered with SAM, you should have a UEI. And then you have to be eligible to do business in the state of Texas. So you can't be on any uh, blacklist as far as uh, contracting with the state government or uh, the federal government. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about before I pass this back over to Hope, and, and folks, if there are questions, I realize that this is incredibly dense information and we just dove right into it because we want to save time for questions. If you do have questions, please, please, please use the chat to put your questions in the chat so that we can make sure to address them. Uh, I've, we've talked a little bit about the eligible categories of people experiencing homelessness and category one literal homeless and category four fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, but we thought it would be helpful to just show you on the slide in terms of like what we're talking about when we say someone that's experiencing literal homelessness, that's someone who's sleeping in a publicly a public or 
or privately funded emergency shelter. They're sleeping in a place not meant for human habitation. Maybe that's the, you know, in their in their um, sedan at the Walmart parking lot or in the parking lot of a church somewhere. Those are folks that would auto obviously qualify under HUD's definition of literal homelessness. Um, and similarly, folks that are fleeing domestic violence also qualify under the definition of literal homelessness, even if they have not actually um, flown, as it were, like the, you know, let's say the night before you encountered them, they were staying with their abuser and they are actively in the process of trying to get away from that person, that person would likely qualify under category four as long as they meet the other requirements, which they have no other residents identified and they lack the resources or support networks to obtain other permanent housing. Uh, I wanna caveat this category four definition because effective October 1, HUD is uh, modifying the category four definition following the 2022 reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act that will expand the definition of who qualifies under category four to include uh, anyone fleeing any type of uh, violence in their home. That could include uh, youth that are fleeing an abusive parent or caregiver. That could be a variety of folks that would then qualify based on their category four status. So I think that's really important for folks to understand and, and is something that, that we'll go over uh, in depth in another setting. And so with that, I will pass it back to Hope. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so taking a little bit of a transition, um, wanted to talk about Housing First. So Housing First has been a longstanding priority of both HUD and the COC, uh, so much so that all projects funded under the COC program are required to adopt and implement this approach into their funded project. Um, this is not the only time in this presentation that we will mention Housing First. Uh, but Housing First is essentially a low barrier approach to programming where folks are screened in rather than screened out of your pro of the project. Uh, so that includes um, no programmatic prerequisites to project or project entry or to gain permit housing. Um, so for example, you could not under this funding type require that participants maintain sobriety or compete. Uh, complete substance use tre treatment prior to entry or any kind of uh, any other treatment or service prior to entry. Um, and uh, also under this approach, supportive services are voluntary. Um, so again, not requiring any services, but persistently engaging folks uh, to ensure that their housing stability needs are met uh, with few uh, requirements uh, over what that looks like. Um, additionally, participants will have, you know, full rights, responsibilities, and legal protections under the law in this program, just like they would, uh, if they were renting through the free market. Um, but there will be, uh, we're, we're about to get into the application process, um, and there's, uh, you know, a couple of places throughout our application where projects are required to, uh, provide narrative of how their project will align with uh, Housing First priorities. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so moving on to what the COC program application looks like. Um, so before we get into what the application looks like at the individual applicant level, um, I think it's important to kind of take a step back and look at the process as a whole, which is what we call um, the COC application, uh, which contains three distinct parts. Um, so the first being the COC application, which is something that we as THN submit on behalf of the Texas Balance of State Continuum of Care, um, requires us to answer a series of questions and narratives uh, that speak to uh, how the COC works and what we're doing as a COC. Uh, so we complete an application uh, alongside individual applications. Uh, and this is posted online uh, prior to submission for stakeholder review and feedback uh, after it is approved by our COC board. Um, 
The second is the priority listing or ranking. Um, so we are required to evaluate all project applications submitted in the competitive process and then rank them competitively, which becomes the priority listing. Uh, and generally, um, applications are funded in order of our priority listing. Um, so this is also something that we as THN submit on behalf of the COC following approval by our COC board and also uh, publish this online uh, on our COC page of our website when that is available. Um, and last but certainly not least is the individual project applications from eligible entities throughout the balance of state. Um, so these include materials submitted by project applications to both HUD and to the COC. Um, so it's uh, kind of a two-part application process. So applicants not only submit materials to us as the COC for review and ranking and scoring, uh, but they also submit a separate application to HUD through a platform called eSnaps. Um, and the totality of this process occurs in 90 days from start to finish. Um, and the 90 day deadline is the deadline for COCs to respond to the NOFO, not necessarily individual applicants. Um, we'll get into the, the timeline more on uh, another slide, but generally um, applicants have uh, about a two week window within this 90 day time frame to successfully submit all of their materials to HUD or to THN and to HUD. Uh, so we recognize that it is quite a big lift for all parties involved, um, not only individual applicants, but also COC and, COCs and HUD as well. So this is a very simplified version of what the competition process looks like for the Texas Balance of State COC, starting with THN developing an RFP or request for proposals. Uh, in addition to developing project applications and uh, project evaluation criteria, which then go to the COC board for review and approval. Uh, and our RFP will spell out, um, you know, exactly um, what we're looking for, like the types of applications that are available, the amounts of money that are available, any kind of budget considerations or additional requirements. Uh, from the COC is all spelled out in our RFP. So I would highly encourage you to review that in its entirety when it's available if you are planning to apply for funds. Uh, so following approval from the board, um, TH THN staff post these materials to our website. Uh, we also communicate this via our competition listserv, which we have a sign up for later in this agenda. Um, and then in this stage, we also host uh, trainings and provide technical assistance to applicants. Um, we, that said, we cannot provide any technical assistance that will give you a competitive edge over another applicant, uh, but we can help you kind of navigate the application platform system uh, and answer those kinds of uh, technical assistance questions. Um, so, once an applicant successfully submits all of their materials to THN, um, those materials go on to what's called the IRT um, or independent review team. And I'm on the, the third stage here in purple. Um, so applicants that meet our minimum threshold and eligibility requirements um, will have their applications reviewed by the independent review team, which is a group of stakeholders throughout the balance of state that are tasked with reviewing and scoring applications based on some predefined scoring criteria that is approved in the first stage of this process. Uh, and then uh, again, I think I said this earlier, but THN then ranks projects in the order of their objective score. Uh, and then finally, we package everything up and submit uh, the application to HUD uh, within the 90 day time frame. And with that, I will pass it back to Jim. Yep, so thanks, Hope. So a couple of things, since uh, Tamara and Valerie and I started talking about this, uh, this presentation to the Lubbock community, HUD has released the 2023 
COC program competition notice of funding opportunity that that was actually released yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. I'm already starting to lose track of the days, so that's not a good sign. But uh, that notice of funding opportunity is available on the HUD exchange. The way that they structured this release is the NOFO itself is available. It's about 129 pages long. Uh, there are a variety of collateral documents that are st still yet to be released, uh, specifically what they call detailed instructions. And those detailed instructions are really critical for both applicants and COCs to, um, to put together their local application process and successfully respond to the notice. We're anticipating that the remainder of the collateral app, um, application materials will be available by the end of July. But our next steps are beginning the work on the local competition request for proposals, the other collateral materials that Hope was mentioning, such as the uh, uh, application itself in our grant management software platform and the evaluation criteria. Uh, we're planning for all of those materials to go before the board uh, in the month of July. Um, the deadline for COCs to respond to this specific NOFO is 9 28 2023 And while I'm not able to tell you specifically when our local application will close, there is a requirement in the NOFO that applications are due to the COC uh, no sooner than 30 days before the uh, NOFO deadline of 9-28-2023. So uh, an interested person can work backwards from that to kind of get an idea about when the application window will open and close. Um, we will submit or solicit all application materials via our grant management platform, SurveyMonkey Apply. You'll also hear it talked about as momentum. You may also hear it spoken about as THN competition uh, website. Uh, that all of that information and all of the solicited materials will be detailed uh, in the request for proposals, along with a variety of appendices that will help you understand exactly what we're asking for. We're going to talk a little bit more about what exactly we're going to ask for in this presentation, but. Just so, uh, just so you know that RFP is really like, that's essential between the RFP, the NOFO and the detailed instructions, it's a virtually impossible to uh, submit a viable application without all three of those documents. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Hope for a few slides. So this is a, a visual of the types of funding that are generally available in a given year and who is eligible to apply for those pots of funding, uh, what project types are generally available, uh, and the application types that are generally available. Um, so something I wanted to talk about here is that all new applicants, uh, so uh, anyone that is uh, applying for new funding, um, would apply under either the COC bonus or the DV bonus. Uh, so those are funds um, that are available specifically to create uh, new or expansion projects. Um, and uh, DV bonus projects, um, as a COC, we have limited those to exclusively victim service providers in the last competition, and that is something we will carry forward in the future. Uh, so in order to be eligible to apply for uh, funds under the domestic violence bonus, you do need to be a victim service provider who exclusively serves uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence. Um, but if you are not a victim service provider and you're interested in applying, you can still apply under our COC bonus, uh, which is where we fund new or expansion projects. Uh, expansion projects are... Um, for applicants who have an existing renewal project and are seeking to expand those activities. Uh, so if you're a first time applicant, you're likely going to be under uh, the new applicant COC bonus pathway. Um, but all of this is will be laid out in our RFP when that's released. I know I've said it once, I'll probably say it again in this presentation. I would highly encourage you to really review that uh, in its entirety when it's available. 
So moving on to what the application looks like for individual projects, uh, there are a few distinct phases and components of this process. Uh, so I'm going to kind of walk through each of these stages, uh, and then we'll get into more detail about some of the specific items in the next couple of slides. Um, but the process begins with what's called the threshold verification stage. Uh, so in this stage, um, applicants are required to respond to a limited series of questions that allow us to verify that you're eligible to operate a COC program. Um, so here we collect basic information on your organization, such as uh, your employer's uh, identification number or EIN uh, and your unique entity ID, uh, which is maintained through your SAM registration. Um, we also collect uh, the proposed geographic region that you're proposing to serve to ensure that you're uh, eligible uh, to serve folks in the balance of state, um, and then the application that you're planning to pursue, um, and then some very limited details on the project itself, like anticipated budget and anticipated activities so that we can do a limited review of cost allowability in this stage. Um, so applicants that can satisfy our minimum threshold verification requirements will advance to the full application stage. Uh, so this stage is where we really get into project design and details. Um, and we also collect a series of uploads, uh, which I'll get he into here in a second. Um, but applicants who submit all of these materials to us in the full application stage will advance to the quality review stage which is where uh, THN, uh, Texas Balance of State staff, review and provide feedback um, or necessary corrections on your eSNAPS materials. Uh, so ensuring that the, the version of your application that HUD sees uh, is the, the highest quality it can be. Um, and I know we kind of talked through the IRT process uh, a couple slides ago, but I wanna reiterate it here. Uh, so folks who, um, following the quality review stage, folks then go to the independent re review team for assessment, and that is where projects are competitively scored and uh, ranked and assessed based on predefined evaluation criteria that will be available to you, um, and then uh, ranked competitively based on the outcomes of that scoring. Uh, and then finally, uh, the submission to HUD through um, the eSNAPS platform. Uh, so we anticipate this timeline to be um, as early as July. I know we're in July now, um, but could start as early as July um, uh, to August, but the dates are to be announced. Uh, but we will communicate the um, availability of the full application and the RFP through our listserv. Uh, so like I had mentioned previously, uh, the full application is really an opportunity to give us as much detail about the proposed project and your organization. So applicants will respond to a series of narrative questions specific to each component type, uh, in addition to questions that speak to your organization's administrative and financial capacity. Um, something important to point out here is that um, if you apply through our process uh, and satisfy our minimum threshold requirements, but throughout the course of responding to the full application, you decide to change or alter something that you initially identified in the threshold verification stage, it is the responsibility of the applicant to communicate those changes to THN uh, so that we can make sure that you are still on the right track and headed in the right direction. Uh, so one of the required uploads in this stage is a letter of support from your local homeless coalition chair uh, or LHC chair. Uh, so if you are considering applying for funding, I would start having these conversations now um, so that you are not waiting. Uh, you're not delayed when the, the full application becomes available. Um, so in the full application stage, we also uh, require uh, 
applicants to respond to a monitoring report. Uh, so this is a series of questions about any state or federal monitorings that your organization has been subject to in the last three years and the results of those monitorings. Uh, we don't necessarily ask for a copy of your monitoring report, but we do ask if there were any findings identified and how many. Um, and then here we also collect information about any uh, state or federal funds that have been recaptured in the last several years by your organization or from your organization. And with that, I will hand it back to Jim. Yep. Uh, thanks, Hope. And so the East Maps portion of this project application, this is historically what has tripped folks up the most, um, I would say. Uh, and if you've applied to the Balance of State COC in the past, you might recall that East Naps was actually a scored component of the application process at that time. It has since been removed as a scored component of the application process. So we really don't want to score you on how well you can complete HUD's antiquated grant management uh, software. We really want to score projects or we want the IRT to score projects based on their merit. And so uh, we do still, however, have to collect information from eSNAPs. So those two items are the eSNAPs applicant profile. So that is where you identify yourself to HUD. You give them a lot of the same information that you're giving us in the application uh, in our application portal. Um, so once you've completed your applicant profile, there's an option to export that in eSNAPs, and then you will simply attach that to the SurveyMonkey uh, application portal. Uh, the, the second uh, piece is actually a little bit more complicated. This is the eSNAPS project application. This is where you will upload, uh, export and upload a completed eSNAPS project application to uh, SurveyMonkey apply. Um, that eSNAPS project application should match the information that you've supplied in other parts of the application, but this is where you will give a project narrative to HUD. You will talk about the number of people that you're planning to serve, any specific subpopulations, where you identify the type of funding that you're seeking, whether that be COC bonus or DV bonus or renewal funding. That's also where you will uh, give HUD a detailed budget that, um, that they review and will become the basis for a contractual agreement if you're selected for award. The eSNAPS application is very, very, very important, but it's not a scored component of your project application. So that means that Hope and myself and Axton and other members of the COC staff can provide support around these uh, components of the application process. We can't obviously do it for you and um, we'll probably point you to written guidance that already exists that might frustrate you, but we can provide support to you um, if you get into this process and kind of get lost in the eSNAPS project applications. Um, in addition, you will, if you are planning to apply, you will need to collect what is called a certification of consistency with the consolidated plan or HUD form 2991. Um, if in Lubbock, you would collect that form from the city of Lubbock Community Development Department. And uh, so again, recommend that if you're planning to apply, you don't wait because sometimes, and I believe in Lubbock, that it may need to go through council or it may need to go through some path that takes a fair amount of time. And again, we don't want someone to be disqualified on the basis of a technicality because they weren't able to get their certification of consistency signed. What this form is that basically is the jurisdiction certification that the activities in your project application are in alignment with the community's consolidated plan. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's okay. Most weeks don't, most folks don't even know that the consolidated plan exists in many communities, uh, but it is uh, the way that your community commun uh, tells HUD how they're using uh, various federal dollars and how they're addressing uh, issues of poverty and, and housing instability in your community. Uh, so you would need to collect, again, a certification of consistency with that consolidated plan um, and through the city. Now, if you're planning to serve uh, unincorporated parts of the county or parts of uh, outside of Lubbock, I know the South Plains Homeless Consortium has a kind of large uh, geography. If you're planning to serve like Hunt County or um, something else uh, around Lubbock, um, 
you, you could collect a certification of consistency from the state of Texas. Uh, and all of that will be detailed in the request for proposals in terms of where you need your certification from. Uh, so with that, that kind of like wraps up the actual full application portion. We did want to talk with you, given that the NOFO has been released. Uh, this slide did say what we well, actually still does. It says what we believe to be HUD homeless policy priorities. That actually should be stricken in to say HUD homeless policy priorities because these are directly from the notice of funding opportunity. Um, so specifically, there's nine policy priorities. I'm just going to kind of rattle them off. Ending homelessness for all persons. So they don't, they're they're really interested in addressing homelessness as a community issue, not a as a like in terms of like a subpopulation issue, with the exception of, of course, the DV bonus funds are specifically for survivors of domestic violence. Uh, they are uh, continuing to prioritize use, the use of a housing first approach. They really want to see communities reduce unsheltered homelessness. So, uh, you know, those folks, again, living out um, in the Walmart parking lot or behind the church or wherever they are, those are the folks that HUD is hoping to target with, with the COC program uh, for this application cycle. These policy priorities do change uh, from year to year and certainly from administration to administration. So there may be uh, new policy priorities in 2024. Uh, in fact, I would anticipate that there will be but as of right now, these are HUD's policy priorities. So improving system performance, we haven't talked a whole lot about that, but HUD wants to know how projects they're funding positively contribute to the performance of the community as a whole, right? So how long are people um, waiting for housing? They wanna see that number going down. They wanna see the uh, retention of housing after assistance stops to stay high. They wanna make sure that folks aren't returning to homelessness after assistance stops. All of those are things that HUD looks at um, and will likely be incorporated into our local application process. Similarly, they want to know how you're leveraging your partnerships in the community with housing and healthcare um, partners. So, uh, you know, they really want applicants to these funds to bring along additional resources that are not federally funded or funded by a different department at the federal level or state level. Um, and so there will be more about each of these in the request for proposals. Uh, they're also looking for a commitment to race equity, right? HUD believes that, and I think the data bears out that there are disparities in terms of who is experiencing homelessness in a given community. I have not looked at Lubbock's data in a while, uh, but I would not be surprised to see that certain demographic populations are overrepresented in things like the point in time count and housing inventory count. Uh, they're also looking for applicants to improve uh, the way services are delivered to the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and, and specifically, that demographic experiences homelessness at a significantly higher rate than uh, someone who does not identify as part of that community. And so HUD expectation for COC funded applicants is that they are at the very least considering how they will um, improve their assistance to those communities. Also, how communities will engage persons with lived experience in the design and implementation of their project applications. So there is a requirement for applicants to the COC program, a HUD requirement, that you have to have someone with lived expertise on your board of directors or equivalent policy making um, group. And, uh, and HUD is continuing that. In fact, I think they're getting deeper into uh, the lived experience to include not just one person on your board that might hear program updates once a quarter, but really how are you engaging people that have gone through your program to improve project design? Um, and then finally, uh, HUD really wants to see an increase to affordable housing, which is interesting juxtaposition because they don't actually fund new construction acquisition or rehabilitation um, of uh, permanent housing and this competition, but that is something that is a priority for the, for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Hey, Jim. So, yes. Can you go back a slide? I just wanted to clarify. Um, you spoke to the requirement for um, funded applicants to have uh, someone with lived experience on their board of directors. I just wanted to yes. clarify that requirement comes into effect after you're awarded funding. You. Yeah, you're not right. required. That's not a prerequisite to getting funding. 
Yes, that's thank you for that uh, clarification. Hope. Yeah, that is that is a requirement for funded agencies. So if you were apply and don't have someone on your board that fits that criteria right now, you would have approximately 12 to 18 months uh, if you're uh, selected for award uh, to meet that requirement. Um, I want to move us along to the COC's priorities because these are a little bit different, uh, but still kind of similar. So we want to see a community-wide commitment. Like we want to know at THM, since Hope, neither Hope nor I are in Lubbock, we want to know that y'all are talking to one another and developing project applications that are representative of partnerships. Um, so not to say that everyone has to play together, but that folks should not be going into this or uh, organizations should not be going into this alone. It's not, a, it's not a, you know, one organization is not going to be able to solve the problem. So we really want to see evidence of a community-wide commitment, and we get at that through the application itself. Uh, we want to see that folks are, like HUD, bringing housing or healthcare resources to the table um, without getting way into the weeds. You know, the COC is scored to the extent that we bring housing and healthcare resources along. So whether you're in Lubbock or Laredo or Texarkana, we're going to be asking folks to bring additional resources to the table. Um, and so that's something that I would anticipate in the project application. We want to know about your landlord engagement strategy. Um, we want to know that you have folks on staff that are uh, prepared and able to support people to access SOAR, which stands for Social Security um, Income, Social Security Disability Income, Outreach, Access, and Recovery, which is a special uh, program through the Social Security Administration that's targeted to people experiencing homelessness or have histories of homelessness. Not that you need to have that at the time you apply, simply that you have a commitment to walking with us on that journey of helping people get uh, access to as many uh, benefits as they are eligible and is appropriate for that household. Um, kind of like HUD uh, had on the previous slide, targeting the hardest to serve. You know, we wanna know how this project is gonna positively benefit your communities. Um, like how is it gonna benefit the Downtown Business Alliance? How is it going to benefit, you know, the faith-based group? We want to know how um, this project is decreasing the strain on all of the other systems in your community. So typically those are people living unsheltered, but those mo may be people with other, um, what I would call severe service needs. So again, something to kind of uh, plan for in the project application is, how, how are you targeting those folks that without assistance are gonna languish on the streets and are gonna become the ire of you know, city council and downtown business alliance and are just bouncing from church to church to church trying to get assistance. Um, again, we also like HUD want to see how you're um, engaging people with lived expertise in the design of your project application and the implementation of it if selected for award. Um, and then we also wanna know like what are the, are there underserved communities in within your geographic area that you're targeting with these resources? If that's the LGBTQ plus community, that's, that's great. If it's some other underserved uh, group in your community, similarly, we wanna know that, right? And I think what's important here is that in the RFP, we'll talk more in more depth about all of these priorities so that you have a better understanding specifically what we're looking for um, and how you will, if you will or would not be able to satisfy that as an expectation moving forward. So I know that's a lot of words. We're at time just about. There are applicant, um, a slide here for what applicants can do. Next, one is signing up for the competition updates, uh, making sure your SAM registration is updated, uh, getting started on your eSNAPS applicant profile, um, reviewing HUD resources on the HUD exchange. And I really intended to leave more time for question and answers. So I'm gonna stop talking and see if this addressed any questions that folks in the room had, or if you have specific questions, you can come off a of mute or you can put them in the chat. And again, if we can't answer them right now, we will answer them in writing as a follow-up. Also, 
It's just just a note. Hey, Janice, Andrea. Hey, Andrea. How's it going? Um, <laughs> we're just wanting to make sure that if, um, you guys know that um, Open Door wants to be a resource to you. If you have any questions or if you're trying to navigate this process at all, since we have done it a few years in a row, we're happy to be a local man. Chad specifically said I could share his phone number with you all. Make sure that, I mean, obviously it'll go off the recording, but um, Andrea, I think that's a really good, I'm glad that you spoke up because there is frequently a common misconception in the community where there's already one uh, recipient of these funds that there's no more funding available in the community. Uh, without going way into the weeds, uh, this is, we want more applicants from Lubbock to participate in this process um, because the reality is that the, you know, the issue of homelessness in Lubbock is not going away without a concerted effort to address it and it cannot be or should not be uh, one organization or another. Um, so, you know, we, again, I just want to reiterate that um, there is more, um, I don't know, I'm going to use a bad analogy, meat on the bone, as it were, for uh, the continuum of care program in the in Lubbock uh, and in the South Plains Homeless Consortium, you know, kind of catchment area. So, uh, I, I again, that is that is a relatively common misconception that I wanted to address. So, thank you for speaking up because it reminded me to do that. Any other questions, comments, concerns, complaints? I, no. If you wanna, I think we may have a question. So okay. if another agency does apply, does that take funds or programs for all? No. So it's what he was saying that the fact that like that's why we've always been like, we'll help you even to do an application. Jim, can you hear me from here? Yes, I, I can yeah. hear you. She asked the question of if there if the if another agency applies and receives funds, does that take money away from somebody who's already funded, in this case from Open Door? And that's not the case. No, uh, no, 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 no. That's that's the more not... merrier. The more money that comes to Lubbock, the better. We're all for it, and that's a yeah. good thing. So yeah, I think in on whole, the that area here in the orange on our map um back here is woefully underfunded, right? Um, HUD does have formulas that they use to calculate uh, approximately how much a community would need to access. Every county on this map gets uh, has is a part of that formula. So even places like Loving County, there's a dollar amount that HUD has assigned uh, to Loving County. Um, the reality is, is that um, there's like 600 people in Loving and they probably all know one another, right? And so like, is, there, is anyone ever going to come up from Loving, Loving County? County? Uh, to apply for for funds, and so um, where I'm going with that is that there again is a um, it is a highly competitive application process. Any someone submitting an application from another organization in Lubbock would not take away from Lubbock Open Door, um, and I think I'm trying to figure out the best way to say what I'm thinking. So like. On an annual basis, there will be some somewhere between um, three to five million dollars available for COC bonus funding for our continuum of care. This is a hypothetical example. HUD has not released the figures for this year, so don't you know? Don't take this and run with it. Um, in prior years, we have seen that there is sometimes a uh, we don't have enough applicants to to fill up all of that bonus funding. It does not guarantee that if you submit an application and we approve it, that it will automatically be funded by HUD, including Lubbock Open Door, right? Like none of this is guaranteed, but the reality is that we do need more applicants so that we can demonstrate the need that exists to HUD. Um, but it, again, it doesn't take away from anyone that's already participating. There is a way for funded projects to lose the funding that they have allocated to them uh, and that's a totally separate process, but is a good plug for our policies on the THN website, which we can make sure go out after this. We have what we call a reallocation policy, which is the process that the COC uses to redirect funding from one organization that's already receiving it to another organization. And that's typically based on performance or spending. I think we have another question. Okay. 
So if you, I don't know if you put it in there. Can you mention uh, kind of like you want to see collaboration and how mm -hmm. uh, 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 in the grant process, um, are you like are organizations allowed to like jointly uh, apply for the continuum of care fundings? And if not, uh, if it's more a single organization that is uh, showing proof of collaboration, is that demonstrated through letters of support or MOUs or would there be any advice given on that? Great questions. I do want to be careful about um, how far we go into this, but the short answer to your question is that um, a project application has to have a single applicant that's identified as the primary applicant. So that's the that's the group that will have the contract with HUD when the dust settles and they've approved the application and everything. But you can identify subrecipients through the application process. So subrecipients are organizations that have a you know a financial interest in the project. So maybe you and I don't know who that I don't know who that was talking, but maybe you are really really good at administering rental assistance and there's some partner agency that's really good at uh, administering case management. So those two organizations working together would look like one one being the primary applicant and then someone else being a subrecipient. It's not uh, it's not absolutely necessary for you to identify someone as a subrecipient to demonstrate sufficient coordination. Like that's not exactly what we're looking for when we're looking for that community-wide commitment. We want to know like who you're talking to, like what who's going to be doing what, whether or not that nets in a subrecipient or a recipient relationship. That has no bearing on the scoring of your project application uh, whatsoever. Um, so the the community coordination is really is really through narrative. Now you asked about letters of support. Yes. So we do ask for a letter of support from the local homeless coalition. Uh, in this case of the South Plains Homeless Consortium. But if you're unable to get a letter of support from the South Plains Homeless Consortium uh, or whatever local homeless coalition you're part of, um, you can submit alternate letters of support uh, up to two letters, I believe, is, is kind of what we did last year. Um, all that's still TBD, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, and in that, you could talk about your coordination in that respect as well. Um, does that help? Yes. Okay, great. Any other questions, Joe? These are good questions. <laughs> I, I have one more. Yeah. I noticed on uh, like the notice of funding from the HUD government grant uh, this past week, uh, one thing that I think uh, maybe I'm, I'm new, so I don't quite understand it. I understand that we're technically, with what you talked about today, we applied through the Texas, like, balance of state in yep. order to apply at HUD. Are there other grants that are available through HUD that we don't have to apply through the Texas balance of state? Mm. Um, so there are what HUD calls formula or entitlement grants. Uh -huh. Um, entitlement grants go through a um, consolidated planning jurisdiction. So in Lubbock, the city of Lubbock receives funds directly from HUD. Uh, and in that scenario, we are not part of like the allocation process of those funds. Similarly, um, HUD also allocates formula grants to TDHCA. Those formula grants are then, um, you know, distributed through their own allocation process that don't have anything to do with the balance of state um, necessarily. But in terms of additional funding um, that's specific for people experiencing homelessness, nothing is really jumping out at me as far as you being able, certainly with the continuum of care program, it will probably always look like the structure that I described where you apply to the COC and then the COC agrees or declines to accept your application and then moves you on to the full, you know, to the national competition. Um, but is there a specific funding that you're thinking of maybe that, I, that I'm not a key in no, at all? I don't have it up. I just saw like a list of, and maybe it was more like from uh, the .gov grant uh, website, but I just, I, there was a lot, I, I just remember seeing like 30 notice of funding yesterday. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah. yeah, so if you were, 
If you were looking on grants.gov, that is a repository for the entirety of the federal government. So there's stuff on there from like the Department of Energy, HUD, you know, all kinds of uh, stuff that are that's that gets posted to grants.gov. Um, HUD actually maintains a separate website for the Continuum of Care program competition. We can make sure that that gets dropped in the chat uh, for folks that are uh, looking at this later on. Um, but yeah, in terms of specifically to homelessness, the Continuum of Care program is somewhat unique um, in, in terms of how HUD allocates these funds. Thank you. Yep. So I have a question or a clarification. Okay. Uh, if, if I understood this right, so my organization, we work with people with disabilities, all different types of disabilities. So um, oftentimes people with disabilities, that's a higher rate of, of people that experience homelessness. Um, so, but we don't specifically, we work with people that are homeless, but that's not our... Um, that's your mission, our, right? Yes. If I'm under, yeah, yeah. So, so we, that... So I don't think we would be ever applying to get that because we would we don't work with enough homeless percentage wise sure. to qualify. But and I'm just using fictitious because of, of the agencies that I know, we might be eligible for some funds through like open door because we do really good at case management. Um, and they're working with the homeless. A whole lot of those folks have disabilities. So in, in my fictitious example, um, if Open Door was working with the homeless and we came in doing the case management, we would be able to get into it that way. And and that would actually get us funds um, secondhand through Open Door. But more importantly, that would get us servicing more people with disabilities because that's really yep. what I care about. Yeah, no, so I think the relationship that you just described, it can be operationalized in a couple of ways. It can it can be through the application process where the, you know, this fictitious primary applicant names you as a subrecipient in that application process. Mm -hmm. There's another uh, contractual relationship. So HUD makes a distinction between a uh, subrecipient and subcontractor. So a subcontractor is someone that doesn't have like kind of a programmatic oversight for the administration of the pro program. So mm -hmm. if your role is simply to provide case management or some other, you know, some variation of housing stability case management, it, it's, it's absolutely possible, yeah, that you could, through partnerships with other nonprofits, identify a primary applicant. That primary applicant would apply to the COC program. And then um, through the partnerships, use some of those funds for the, you know, the case management component. Of course, they would have to ask for those funds on the front end. So it's generally better to, 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 to work that out before they apply. Because mm -hmm. if, it, if it, you know, obviously if it's an afterthought, there may not be sufficient funding available that they requested. So I think you probably get where I'm coming, where I'm going with all that. But yeah, I mean, I, what you described sounds relatively common for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's a great question. And I just want to, you know, I just want to reiterate that, like, you know, Hope and myself and Axton are available. If you are, you know, you're like, I, I just don't, I don't know enough uh, this year to apply. Like, we'll answer your questions. Um, you know, if you're not an applicant to the process, um, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Or in terms of like what we can talk about with you, we have to kind of in, assume that everyone at this point is a potential applicant. So we're not you know, going to discuss things that would give you a competitive advantage, but we want to answer your questions. So questions like that, that's absolutely a viable, uh, or not a viable, but a, a valid question that you need to answer before you're, you know, you figure out if you're eligible or before you figure out if it makes sense to apply. And then HUD just uh, listed the resource for dis for determining the distinction between a subrecipient relationship and a subcontractor relationship, which, admittedly, some of the lines there are a little bit blurry, um, as far as like what dis what distinguishes a subrecipient from a subcontractor. 
If you are named as a subcontractor in the application, however, you do have to meet all of the eligibility requirements that the um, main applicant has, uh, has to meet. So you have to have a SAM registration, a UEI number, uh, and all that stuff. And then hope put, I know we're way over on time, y'all, so I'm going to stop talking. Uh, TXBOSCOC at THN.org. That is how you get uh, access to Hope Action and I. We staff that mailbox on a daily basis. So, um, you know, someone will respond to you within the day if you reach out. And Jim, we'll get this recording so I could share with everyone since it's yes. got the direct links. Yes, absolutely. This okay. recording will probably go. Was that was that Valerie or Tamara? It's Valerie. Okay. Yes, this will go out uh, probably certainly by the end of the day tomorrow, maybe later today. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions, you guys? I'm sorry. What? Any other questions? I don't think so. I think we're gonna take it all in. <laughs> it's a lot. It is a lot. Yes. And again, any questions that you come up with after the fact, please don't feel like you got to try to figure it out yourself because that's where you know, you can really go off down the wrong path really quickly. Um, so happy to help support anybody to figure out if this is a good fit. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Thank and y'all have a, have a great day. Me too. Thanks, <laughs> Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.